Good morning. Welcome to the Coastside Land Trust webinar on sea level rise. We are excited to have Dr. David Ravel, a geomorphologist with us today. And I would like to encourage you all to look at any webinars that you may have missed on our website. As you know, our series of webinars are all uh, listed there on the website and you can, um, you can listen to any of them anytime you want. You can share them with your friends and neighbors, a wonderful series of, uh, that covers many, many of the natural flora and fauna of the coast. And today we're gonna be delving into the physics of the coast side. So um, I wanna remind you that all of our uh, webinars are free and supported by your generous do donations. So thank you so much for continuing to support the webinar series that we are excited to present to you. Um, the, the logistics for this webinar are that as we go through it, as Dr. Ravel speaks, you will probably think of some questions that you would like to have answered. So please type those into the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And at the end of the webinar, Dr. Ravel will address as many of those questions as he can. So, um, Let's see, I think that is about it. And I'm going to let Dr. Ravel give you more details about his background. Thank you so much for being with us today, um, Dr. Ravel. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, thanks for inviting me to talk a bit about some of the work that's going on on the, on the South San Mateo coast. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, sea level rise and some of the potential impacts uh, that we're studying uh, with for on a project for the county of San Mateo. Um, and I really want this to be a shared learning experience. Um, I'm going to present a lot of information. So please ask questions in the chat and the Q&A section, and I'll try and answer those. So who am I? Um, I am a coastal geomorphologist and geomorphology is the study of the physical processes that move the geology. Uh, so I study a lot of beaches and shoreline change and estuaries. Um, I got my undergraduate degrees in geography and environmental studies at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I got a master's of science in oceanography at Oregon State uh, where I was studying shoreline change up there. Um, I had my PhD is in coastal geology from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I saw that Dr. Gary Griggs, who was <clears throat> my uh, PhD advisor, also gave us a webinar not too long ago. Um, he's always a great speaker and um, a fountain of wisdom. Um, after my master's, I worked at the Oregon Coastal Management Program, working on regional coastal hazards um, in, uh, up and down much of the Oregon coast. Um, I worked then for Surfrider Foundation, a nonprofit that focuses on beach access, ocean water quality, and uh, marine protected areas. Uh, then I came down uh, for my PhD, and after that, I worked uh, both as a consultant and as a professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, um, teaching coastal management and sustainable um, uh, ocean science. Uh, I have been a consultant since uh, about 2007 and become quite a trusted advisor to many jurisdictions and state agencies and federal agencies on coastal processes and sea level rise. Uh, I started right after uh, I finished my PhD working, doing the first sort of hazard modeling of coastal erosion and coastal flood hazards for the entire state of California for the Pacific Institute and then refine that modeling into um, uh, uh, sort of a hazard uh, tool that you can look at and look at uh, called coastal resilience working with the Nature Conservancy. Um, since then, I've done a lot of vulnerability and adaptation projects around California, and I would define vulnerability as um, what's in the hazards uh, and potentially at risk. And then adaptation is what are we gonna do to reduce uh, those hazards and risk. Um, I have 
been a long proponent of what I call sand shed management, which is sort of linking our, our watersheds and our um, the river of sand as it comes down from the mountains and along the coast, um, arguing that that is a much better unit of measure than some of the um, political boundaries that we often are have forced to make our decisions around. Um, I have been involved in a lot of living shorelines or sort of natural defenses. Um, when there's an erosion issue, for example, I usually approach it from a perspective of what would nature do. Um, one of my projects in my master's uh, up in Cape Lookout in Oregon, beautiful place if you ever get a chance to see it, um, is uh, been there for 22 years and it's been protecting um, the campground and some of the facilities uh, there at a state park. Um, I've been involved in Surfers Point, uh, removing a parking lot down at the mouth of the Ventura River uh, down in Southern California. I was involved in removing a golf course and restoring an upper portion of uh, Devereaux Slough in Santa Barbara. Currently working on a project at Malibu State Beach to reduce some erosion there. And I'm also working on an artificial surf reef in Western Australia. Um, I've been very involved in bar-built estuary management in Pescadero and San Gregorio, and a lot of those creeks are all bar-built estuaries. Um, I've been working on Pescadero in the past, Scott Creek and Waddell Creek in Santa Cruz County and San Lorenzo River and kind of right by the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, uh, among many other systems. And I'd like to think that I take a little bit different approach to adaptation planning, which is really a more holistic approach. Um, there's uh, a lot of things that we can do to reduce the risk from coastal hazards, storm waves, flooding, erosion, um, but uh, not all of them consider the ecology, recreational benefits of the coast and the beach, and what ultimately comes down to who pays and how much are we getting or losing over time. Um, I've been a surfer for 39 years. I love the South San Mateo coast, um, and I've been a father for 12. And uh, sometimes it seems longer and sometimes it seems not just too short. Um, I live in Santa Cruz and frequent the South San Mateo coast. Um, my personal mission is really to, is to create sustainable communities by sharing my passion for the ocean with others. Um, I am currently a principal at Integral Consulting and have been uh, leading their coastal resilience practice, doing projects kind of around the country um, and starting to do more international work. Um, go, next slide. Okay, there it is. So I wanna give you a warning. Um, this is a presentation is based on uh, scientific analysis and projections of possible futures based on the best available science that we have today. Uh, there are uncertainties uh, in the future. Um, some of the results sort of paint a doom and gloom future if we don't do anything, um, but we have choices. And that's what I'm hoping to engage with you as well toward the end in some of the questions to sort of understand what, you know, what the community preferences are for future uh, actions. So we have future choices. We can bury our heads in the sand while there's still sand on the beach and ignore the problem and hope it goes away. We can adapt and take action and reduce the risk, or we can suffer. The reality is we'll probably do a little bit of all of them as we go forward in time. Um, hopefully we take more action sooner so we don't suffer as much. Um, my opinions do not represent any jurisdictions or elected officials. You have some great elected officials. Supervisor Horsley, for example, has been a big champion of this work. Um, and uh, San Mateo County has been a pioneer in California and sort of really starting to address and think about how we think about climate change and move it into something that is actionable every day in the daily maintenance practices and facilities and, and things. So my goal here is to inform, discuss options and inspire some action. I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about some climate science and sea level rise. Uh, I would. That I'll start with some physical process and what are the coastal hazards that we're really considering. Um, what is San Mateo County doing to prepare for climate change? Um, particularly sea level rise, there's a lot of other uh, hazards, wildfire, extreme heat, et cetera, from uh, climate change. I'm not gonna talk much about that, but there's a lot of resources that the county is invested in right now um, that can help inform that discussion. 
we'll talk about what we found that is really at risk and some of the vulnerability assessment results, what, and then get into some of the adaptation options uh, and really ask, what do you think is the best path forward? Um, this report is still in the works. Um, and so the final report will be do, done at the end of the year. Um, and I'll give you some websites on where you can kind of track the progress of it and look at more detail on a lot of the things that the county's doing. So I'm gonna jump into just some very basic climate science uh, and, and how it affects sea level rise. Um, we are here on earth. Let's imagine that this is earth here. Um, and we have a greenhouse effect. And because our atmosphere is made of gases, the sun comes in and it can either bounce off our atmosphere, the top of the greenhouse and get reflected out. It can come in and start and be absorbed at, you know, into the earth and that warms the earth. And then we get some that comes in the atmosphere, bounces out and can kind of re-radiate out. Um, and some of that energy escapes back out past our atmosphere. Others sort of stay inside the atmosphere and increase uh, and keep it at a tolerable temperature. So we have carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, some of the other atmospheric gases that are really important, ozone, um, that are really important for protecting us from this long wave um, solar radiation or sunlight um, and well, keeping it in a, in a manageable temperature range so it's comfortable enough. Um, I'm sure some people are getting tired of the fog, but that's a blessing. Um, so we've caught, so climate changes include ozone holes. Um, we've got the largest one we've ever observed over Antarctica presently, um, and that's caused by basically some of the pollutants that we have emitted over the years that have uh, burned a hole in our protective atmosphere. That allows a lot more infrared radiation. Australia has very high rates of cancer, for example, skin cancer, um, largely because of that. Another uh, major climate change is as we have put more greenhouse gases, this carbon dioxide, methane, et cetera, um, we have effectively put a larger blanket around the earth and that's trapping more heat and it's resulting in a warming of the earth. Um, and these changes can have a lot of rippling effects. Um, there are, there is a, a, an, or a international organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and every five years or so they release a, an update to the to the, the state of the science, the potential impacts and potential solutions to climate change. Um, this one, this, pic, this slide I really like because it's a very clear, and it comes from 2007, but the, the concepts are still valid today. Um, basically, when we have greenhouse gas emissions right now, um, if we were to stop them, there would still be emissions that are already, hooked into the climate system. And those are going to take maybe a century or up to three to really stabilize in the atmosphere. As that blank, and that's that blanket I was talking about, as that blanket sort of thickens and sort of becomes more uniform, we'll see temperature changes, increases, stabilize a little bit later after that by another century or two. That temperature increase is driving sea level rise. And sea level rise occurs in two different ways. One is the melting is as you heat water, it expands and that's called thermal expansion. And then the other one is that as it, that temperature warms, ice starts melting faster and faster and faster. The Arctic Ocean, for example, has uh, been melting in the middle of February where it's typically dark. And what happens as that happens, we start to melt ice, we get another feedback where the, the sun that comes in is now absorbed instead of reflected because white, the white snow or ice tends to reflect the sunlight, whereas in the melted ice situation on the oceans in particular, we're absorbing more of that heat. So it starts to accelerate. Um, so just a couple weeks ago, the IPCC released the first working group result um, in 2000 uh, or in, in 2021. 
Uh, and what I want to point out is this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And what that means is that in this first report that was just released, there was 234 primary authors. Get three scientists in a room to get them to agree on anything is really difficult. This is 234 scientists that agree on things. That's reviewed by other experts and then by other experts and the governments. And then it is finally, before it goes out to the world, it is wordsmithed by the governments. So this is really vetted through an incredibly detailed and complicated peer review process. So what comes out of the IPCC is really a consensus of experts and governments on what climate change is occurring. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that, but I will, you know, unless I have questions, um, but there are some great um, policy summaries and things at this website here. Um, one of the things that often comes up um, in discussions about climate change is what's driving climate change? Um, we've had ice ages in the past, we've had an ice-free earth in the past, and those have all been attributed to climate cycles. And those climate cycles are caused by the uh, rotation of the earth and its orbits around the sun. And there's sort of three different cycles and periods. This first one is the shape of the orbit. Sometimes it's more oval, sometimes it's more round. Um, there's sort of the tilt of the axis of rotation. I like to think about it as a top. And sometimes that orbit goes really round. Sometimes it tilts a little bit more than others. And sometimes it just wobbles. And that uh, rotation, the shape of the orbit, and the wobble of the Earth on its axis all create different time periods in which we can see ice ages and ice free period, time periods. Now global climate modeling, which is a very, you know, is done at about I think it's six different uh, supercomputing climate research facilities around the, around the world. Um, we have one of the top models in the US, but there's a European model, there's an Australian model, there's one in, in, in China. And what we have learned through that global climate modeling process is throughout history we could document we could we could account for all of the changes in an ice and not ice free and temperature variability up until more recently where um, just by these natural cycles and and volcanic emissions and things like that um, but what we can't but today, we cannot account for the climate changes that we are observing unless we include the impact of humans on the natural environment and on their atmosphere. So it has become very clear in this latest version that humans are playing a major role in changing our climate. What is the geologic evidence of sea level rise? Well, if we go through ice cores um, and things like that, uh, you can see that sea levels in the past, this is uh, about the last 350,000 years, um, sea levels have been 20 feet higher than they are presently and 400 feet lower than current conditions. Uh, the last ice age, which was about 18,000 years ago, um, converted a lot of the ocean water, it froze and came onto the continental ice and that lowered ocean levels uh, about 400 feet. So we have the melt, and then as it melts, then we see sea level rising. So how fast could it rise? Um, this is now, I kind of switched the axes on you, but this is uh, zero over here, and this is about 18,000 years, you know, 24,000 years ago in the past when sea level was right around almost 400 feet lower than present. And if we take a trend line over the last, you know, between say 18,000 and about 8,000, so about 10,000 years of, of Earth's history, we get a rate of rise of about almost four feet per hundred years. Um, 
there's been, but there's been times in years past where it's been very rapid. This is six and a half feet over a hundred years. And that occurred for a couple thousand years. More recently, in the last 8,000 years, the time period that humans have really been on earth and um, starting to become more uh, sedentary in development and, and not as much nomadic, um, we have developed earth at about zero. And that um, poses a big global problem because most of our civilization as we know it is built very close to zero. And zero is moving up. And with this acceleration and climate feedbacks caused by this increasing blanket in our atmosphere, it's starting to accelerate. Presently, we're at about a foot per 100 years, but that is projected to go um, up. The California projections are about almost seven feet by 2100, and under the worst case scenario. Um, one of the things, um, so basically, the three main sources for additional water going into the ocean from Antarctica, which has about 200 feet of sea level rise frozen in the ice cap. We have um, the ice from uh, Greenland, which is, uh, I can't see that actually, 22 feet of sea level rise. Um, and that has been unraveling really quickly. There's some wonderful um, documentaries about how quickly Green, Greenland is um, sort of melting. And then we have our mountain glaciers, Glacier National Park, the Swiss Alps, Mount Shasta. Some of these mountain glaciers are, are also melting very quickly. Um, this year, uh, Shasta was ice-free for the first time in recorded history. So it sort of begs the question of how do we turn it off? Um, and there are some options for bringing and capturing some of those greenhouse gases that are really at the forefront of trying to slow, uh, slow this uh, thickening blanket around the earth. Um, so basically, there's two main causes of sea level rise as we see it. Uh, globally, it's really that thermal expansion as ocean warms, the water expands. And as the ice melts, it contributes additional <clears throat> water to the oceans, again, raising it. Now, what happens regionally is, so we have this global rise, but the land, because we're on uh, active tectonic plates, there are some places that are sinking, like New Orleans, for example, because of extraction of oil and gas, groundwater, change sediment supply from the Mississippi out onto some of the landscape, uh, that's actually sinking. And so as the ocean's rising and the land sinking, you get greater than the average sea level rise. Here in San Mateo County, because we're on an active plate, that is, um, it's less than the global average. So we're seeing some uh, reduction compared to other places on earth because um, there is some uplift in this area, um, which is why we have these coastal cliffs, and that helps us um, sort of account for some of the sea level rise, but there's still substantial um, projections for sea level rise. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty around how fast, by when, and so what we tend to do is take more of a scenario approach. Um, it is very clear from the greenhouse gas emissions that oceans will be rising for the next thousand plus years. So the question I like to think when we start looking into the future, instead of being so worried about what elevation sea level rise will get to by what time in the future, we really just notice, we just plan for certain, um, certain elevations and rise. And as we do vulnerability assessments, um, and so I'm gonna shift gears and start to look at what is at risk. Um, and I'd like to really think about what, at what point, 
at what elevation do those risks go from not great or clean up the mess every one, every five, 10, 15 years to something that happens every high tide. And those, the way we would adapt or reduce our risk will differ based on what's causing the problem. Is it erosion? Is it flooding? Well, and at what frequency are we willing to tolerate? So the County of San Mateo um, in 2018 um, launched a uh, this, the sea change report, which looked at a lot of the sea level rise projections and in, potential impacts around the entire county. There was, however, a lack of modeling data available for the South San Mateo County coast. And so that's what this report um, that I'm working on presently with the county um, is sort of filling that gap, looking from Half Moon Bay down to the Santa Cruz um, County boundary. Um, the county has done a tremendous amount of work around climate change. They have pioneered in California a sea level rise flood control district, which sort of um, has pulled together all the cities with the, and the county resources to develop a dedicated funding stream to start to address some of these projected impacts. Um, they're currently working on an update to the local hazard mitigation plan, which is a document that um, interacts with FEMA and FEMA being the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And this local hazard mitigation plan basically says, these are the projects we need to do to reduce our risk. And it's not just flooding, it's wildfire, it's extreme heat. And so there's an update to that going on. Hopefully some of you have participated in those meetings. Um, there's a lot of work at the policy and planning level to try and integrate uh, permitting with considerations of future conditions. And they're also looking at uh, a climate ready climate action plan where they're doing detailed accounting of greenhouse gas emissions, and trying to reduce those emissions over time. And there's been a lot of outreach and engagement over time. Uh, this website has lots of resources for you and I encourage you to check this out. So <clears throat> the vulnerability assessment really, uh, this is the 2018 version and um, the, the report we're working on will do this similar approach. Um, assess the vulnerability, look for things that we can alter and action, make actionable to reduce those vulnerabilities, raise awareness and to really collaborate. Um, we cannot, no one person or no one jurisdiction can solve the challenges of climate change and sea level rise. So we do need to work together with uh, our communities, uh, our industries, our commercial um, and transportation infrastructures. Um, so the, again, as I mentioned, the study boundary that we're doing uh, and the scope of work is we're not only doing the vulnerability, but we're also looking at some of the economic impacts um, and uh, here's where right now we have a lot of the hazard maps already up on the website. So I encourage you to go dig in. Um, I will present little snippets here and there, um, but this is, and the entire report will be ready again at the end of the year. So there is a, the Northern boundary is at near Monty's point, um, just basically the Ritz Carlton just below um, and at the, to, up to the city of Half Moon Bay and down to the Santa Cruz County line. It's about 34 miles coastline. We are looking at um, the same sea level rise scenarios that were looked at in the 2018 sea change document report. Um, we're looking sort of at existing, what's at risk today, um, 0.8 feet, which could occur as early as 2030 and potentially as late as 2060. 1.6 feet of sea level rise, Again, could occur as early as 2045 and potentially as late as 2075 and almost up to five feet of sea level rise is sort of the worst case that we're considering. And that could occur as early as 2095 um, out to about 2135. And this range of predicted uh, timing of when we'll see those elevations really sort of brackets the uncertainty we have about how fast ice will melt and 
um, a lot of assumptions on what kind of um, behaviors humans will take in developing nations and in the US. Um, so we're here in our study, we're looking at coastal erosion. What, you know, what is the potential impacts to the sand dunes and to the cliffs? We're looking at wave flooding from a 1% annual chance storm. Uh, it's often called, called a 100 year storm, but it, you can, if I use an example from Houston, Houston has had four 100 year storms in the last 12 years. Um, so it is a 1% chance of happening in any given year. And if it happens in one year, you still have a 1% chance the following year. We're looking at tidal inundation and closed lagoon flooding. Um, and that happens when, and so we're looking, so not only are we looking at sort of current sea level, we're looking at what happens when you add high tides and storms. That's when most erosion and flooding occurs. It's not during calm conditions. Um, and then we're adding sea level rise and considering the effect of sea level rise with tides and storms on top of it. Um, we have done some modeling of cliff erosion and dune erosion, uh, and those are all available in, in some of the maps. You can see um, what sort of the episodic uh, or storm and seasonal flood extents are in these maps, and then where the erosion hazard extents could be. Uh, and we have used these hazard zones then to intersect with what's on the land and document a, a lot of different um, changes over time and look at what could be exposed. Closed lagoon flooding, a uh, great example here at the mouth of Pescadero uh, Marsh, where the sandbar builds up, um, you know, during the calm summer season, and then it fills up like a bathtub. And um, if we have a lot of rainfall and runoff, then it fills up pretty quickly. A uh, year like this, it's really, uh, not filling up very quickly. Um, you know, we all know that we need some rain. Um, but as sea level rises, a, a lot of these elevations of the beach are set by wave conditions. As long as there's enough sand uh, in along our coast, that will maintain its relation to wave runoff. And so we can assume that as sea level rises, if there is enough sand, that these will also rise and expand the flood extents that occur every year. So we looked uh, at um, what is at the land use, you know, buildings and structures and land um, by land use. We've looked at the transportation and parking. We looked at parks and recreation, the effect of sea level rise on agriculture. Uh, and we've identified some significant facilities uh, and are going to be working to try and provide some guidance on or thoughts on how to best reduce those risks to those facilities. We are also working on some habitat um, evolution uh, in Pescadero and some economic assessments, which are still work in progress. Um, we just completed the uh, a lot of the economic work this week, um, but it's still kind of going through review and everything with the with the county. So I will give you a punchline slide, but not get into all the details, but they will be coming soon. We've generated a whole host of vulnerability maps. And again, here's the websites that you can go and see these maps and zoom into your favorite location. Um, and what we've done is we've combined all these hazard extents um, and sort of color coded it. The darker the color means the sooner things are projected to get flooded or eroded. And then we've color coded uh, the different assets or uh, in by color coded it based on the timing or the elevation of sea level rise when they first get impacted. So you can see here in Pescadero around Water Lane that you know during a major storm you can get flooding and we've seen that already. Um, and you know as sea level rises it starts to increase inland and up in elevation. So um, again, these websites have a lot more detail where you can kind of zoom in to your favorite location. Um, I'm just gonna summarize some of these results here. Uh, so 
with uh, almost five feet of sea level rise, we have 123 primary structures um, at risk, mostly due to erosion. Um, the significant facilities that are at risk, Pescadero Cal Fire Station, which the county is already starting to look to relocate. Um, there's a corporate maintenance yard uh, on Pescadero Road that also becomes at risk. The Pigeon Point Lighthouse, uh, the Gazos Creek sort of gas station and brewery, and then part, portions of the Ritz-Carlton um, become at risk as well. The most vulnerable community is really, uh, is really Martins Beach. Um, there's about 50 homes that become vulnerable to both coastal wave flooding and erosion uh, with about with 4.9 feet of sea level rise. And presently, 15 oceanfront homes are vulnerable to wave flooding. You can see this revetment, which is one of the potential adaptation strategies that's been built to try and uh, reduce the wave exposure. Uh, here it is during a decent size storm uh, a couple winters ago. Um, we've also looked, uh, taken an initial look at some of the populations uh, and social vulnerability um, using the 2010 census data. 2020 has not yet, um, or excuse me. Um, so the, using some of the 2010 census data and then sort of translating some of that with what have slowly come out from the 2020 census data. Basically, the total population that lives in that combined sea level rise hazard areas is about 260 people. Um, it's about double the number that is uh, watching the webinar today. Uh, there are about 112 housing units um, and there's some sort of per capita income, percent of poverty. Um, so this, these households represent about five, almost 6% of the total census population and about 11% in the Pescadero sort of block group, which is sort of the scale of the census. However, this is really who is there living there today. And we know that there are potentially a lot of other user groups that are not evaluated. There's tribal communities, subsistence fishermen, low income, there's renters, there's a lot of tourists, a lot of out-of-town recreational users, we have seasonal agricultural workers and ag leaseholders that are not accounted in this sort of census scale analysis. Um, so this is something that I think the county will be investigating further uh, down the road. When we look at the agricultural sector, um, there is uh, a lot of um, fields that are exposed um, to erosion. There's about 30 acres. Much of it is grazing land, and a lot of it is just right along the cliff edges. So it's primarily affecting some of these access roads that sort of circle the fields. Um, and when we look at flooding uh, related to that closed estuary, we can see that there are some expansion of uh, risk in certain parts uh, that become more flooded. And it's not because, it, and it's a bit unclear as to what the impact of that increased flooding will uh, have uh, on the soil chemistry and the potential efficacy of, of uh, crop farming. Uh, in the fields. So um, this is my personal perspective of, as uh, during the this uh, project, I've had the good fortune of talking to about a half a dozen well-established um, farming families just to get their perspective on how viable agriculture is today, what problems they have, how much you know they they make, and how much they lose following flood events. Um, but agriculture is really tricky for us to assess in its entirety in this report. It's vulnerable to much more than sea level rise. Heat, precipitation, the length of droughts all probably play a more important role than sea level rise in affecting agriculture. 
Ag, ag in San Mateo County is critically dependent on Highway 1 to move products to market, to get it to packaging and shipping. Much of it is packaged in Salinas, so they have a substantial drive to get their product to market every day. Um, a lot of the agriculture is rainfall dependent. There's not tremendous amount of reservoirs and surface storage. And the aquifers or the groundwater in which uh, they are pumping well water uh, often is very shallow and uh, recharges quickly or depletes quickly depending upon how long droughts are or how much rainfall occurs in a given year. There's a lot of regulations around monitoring, um, organic certification and stuff that makes agriculture very difficult. Workforce housing is another big issue. Um, again, much all of this is much farther beyond sea level rise. And we also really got to get, I got to get a, a good sense of a generational shift that's kind of, we're kind of on the precipice of where established farmers are still trying to, you know, keep the family farms going. Um, but there's new incubators, new people with uh, different approaches. Um, and some of those are really exciting. They're trying to rebuild soils and soils. Um, agriculture is often considered to be a source of greenhouse gas emissions. And some of these new uh, agriculturalists are really looking at rebuilding soils to capture and sequester carbon so that we're reducing uh, overall climate greenhouse gases uh, and looking at what the possibility for different crops are. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities, proximity to Silicon Valley and other local markets. Um, so um, transportation is probably the biggest one. We have a lot of impacts uh, associated with Highway 1 and Pescadero Road. It's about four and a half miles at risk from erosion. Um, in some of these locations, Pescadero Road, which already floods, um, and 11 parking lots and a lot of unofficial parking areas. And then we have a lot of uh, state parks, uh, state and county parks, Pigeon Point Lighthouse, uh, a lot of the hiking trails right along the coast, almost 16 miles of trailer at risk, some of the bathrooms, uh, and then a lot of sensitive habitat and cultural and historically significant artifacts and places. There's been a lot of uh, tribal villages, sites, uh, particularly around Franklin Point, Nanya Nuevo, uh, that are at risk. Some of them have already been lost, or shipwrecks, things like that. Um, the punchline on the economics is that we have a lot of erosion um, caused by um, primarily cliff erosion, and it's greater than um, 200 million. Um, in damages to both land and structures. Um, and what we see is that there's not that many structures overall over time, but a lot more um, land steadily increases. Um, so erosion causes the highest risk, Highway 1, transportation, com commerce, uh, coastal access, Pescadero Martins Beach, and then the cultural resources at Arnie Nuevo with some agricultural impacts. Um, so then I'm going to shift gears here and try and pick up the pace because I really want to hear from uh, questions from you and um, try and understand what the adaptation approaches that you may prefer are. So adaptation um, had, comes in many different forms. Uh, you can do nothing. We can accommodate, um, protect with coastal armoring or beach nourishment. Um, or retreat, move out of the way gracefully. And the key word here is manage. This is not an evacuation. It's not a hurricane coming run, helter skelter. How do we slowly get out of the way and move away from hazardous areas? There's a lot of ways to protect. Um, this is Santa Cruz or soil nail walls and seawalls, rock revetments, which Caltrans uses regularly, um, natural uh, features, sand dunes provide, and beaches provide natural flood protection. We can nourish beaches to widen them um, and uh, allow more buffering. We could retain sand, this is Santa Cruz Harbor. You can see how much sand is backed up uh, at Seabright Beach. And then there's sort of back walls and things like that. We can also accommodate, we can increase our setbacks so that erosion can occur. 
nourishing the beaches. We can put roads and things on causeways or elevate homes. Uh, one proposal here um, that was uh, uh, looked at, uh, explored partly as part of the restoration of Butano Creek was potentially uh, putting up the most vulnerable section of roads on the road on a causeway. Um, manage retreat again, this is a management. Um, you know, this is a great example of what happens when you armor the coast. You can see that in 2002, uh, the beach is gone, the water's uh, lapping up on, along the structure. This is Stillwell Hall down in the city of Sand City and Fort Ord National Monument now. Um, it's an old officer's club. Um, when it was converted from a, a military base to a, a park, um, they removed that and took out the revetment in just three years, uh, natural erosion restored that beach. Um, this is an example of a relocation down in San Simeon. Um, this took almost 20 years to occur, but you can see that they abandoned this and retrieved the road about 500 feet and bought a lot more time for, this is um, really close to where all the elephant seals haul out. But everything that we do has an impact. Construction cost, increasing maintenance costs, what's the impact on ecology? Where do shorebirds go if there's no beach? Um, what's the recreational value? What are the, what's the views? What's the aesthetics? Is it, what uh, impacts does it have to social you know, um, equity? Uh, what about low cost recreation? And what about the tourism industry? Is it still going to be around? So we have to consider all of those as we think about adaptation. So um, this one, um, so based on the results of the vulnerability assessment, I've kind of identified these sort of potential areas of adaptation. Um, Highway one clearly um, is a critical one. Uh, Pescadero Road, state parks, all of these are things that we could do or not. And so I'm really hoping in the questions uh, that you guys can provide some thoughts on which ones you'd really like more details on. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of an example for the Highway 1 just to give you a sense of what would, you know, we'll be working on. So we'll be thinking about when we start to implement these things. How much does it cost? How does it affect the travel times, greenhouse gas emissions, recreational access, habitat changes? Um, and so we'll be looking at what if we just kind of keep doing what we're doing, armor it? What about looking at some living shorelines, maybe building some dunes at Gazos Creek and Bean Hollow to reduce some of that uh, wave flooding and, and erosion? Um, looking potentially at beach nourishment and what about realignment? Caltrans in 2008 conducted a study and looked at different uh, reroutes um, with uh, some really big price tags. This is you know, $1.2 billion to reroute from Bean Hollow Road through Pescadero uh, and up to San Gregorio. Um, and so we'll be kind of considering these. Um, uh, these are sort of some of the costs of what they projected. Um, we'll be reevaluating those uh, and comparing them to some of the other strategies that may um, also be in, in included. So, and then what we'll try and do is figure out, you know, right now Caltrans is protecting. They're gonna maintain the revetments. Um, but you know, anything that's any kind of reroute is going to take years and years. So what kind of time do we need to plan and implement things before they're needed? Um, because we don't want to have to close Highway 1 or everybody gets annoyed when it's one lane traffic because the culverts failed again and things like that. So we really need to think about that and also identify what types of triggers are, are do we need to monitor so that we start the planning of the next phase of adaptation before we need it. Uh, if we do everything in emergency response, that's the most expensive thing we can do. And there's lots of ways to trigger that by sea level rise elevation, by how fast sea level is rising, by some specific time in the future or exposure, how frequently does Pescadero Road get flooded? Um, and then what's the distance between Highway 1 and the cliff edge? Um, what kind of damages occur, cost. So all of those, you know, here I would occur up here. You could substitute time with any of those types of triggers. Um, 
and that's part of what we'll be helping the city or the county uh, with. So I am done talking. I went a little bit longer than I hope, but I'm happy to stick around um, after and try and answer as many questions as I can. So I'd really like thoughts on some of you know, what areas are you concerned about, what adaptation approaches do you prefer, and what resources are needed, and ultimately, what's the vision for the South San Mateo folks? Thank you. All right. Thank you for this great presentation. And I know, and, and this is a, a unique Q&A because this is you're sort of asking also for people to be sharing some of their own, you know, their own preferences on, on adaptation. So for those of you who are sticking around, make sure that you're taking that opportunity to have this discussion because I think this is really valuable also for the work that's being done. Um, so a couple of questions, a couple of folks are talking about if, or asking if you could comment on some of the sea level rise work and um, that's been, that in the study on the bay side of San Mateo County or just, or even like from the Ritz up? Um, they're, they have, they're all looking at these same sort of processes. Obviously in San Francisco Bay, we don't have as much erosion issues. Um, there's different complications with sort of land subsidence and um, the mud flats and the wetlands sort of not being able to keep up with sea level rise because of changes to sediment supply uh, and development. Um, but these are sort of consistent. Um, you know, again, I would I would encourage folks who are really interested to look at that um, this uh, the sea change website here. Um, they have uh, links to that 2018 report uh, with lots of details. Great. Um, and speaking to your area, can, can anything, do you have thoughts on anything that can be done to protect the remaining archaeological site at Anya Nuevo and Franklin Point? That's a really tricky question. I think part of it is, um, you know, there's some just in looking at some of the historic topographic data, in 10 years, we've seen a huge amount of sand lost in vertically uh, toward the end of Onion Nuevo. And that's, of course, you know, the, a lot of the Native Americans like to be by the water. I mean, they're like us. They wanted to be by where there's fresh water and by the ocean where their resources are. Uh, and so, Unfortunately, a lot of those are being lost. Um, state parks, and there's a wonderful uh, archeologist, um, Ar Arkema is his last name, I'm trying to think of. Great guy, he's got, he would be a great person to give a talk. <laughs> um, I would highly recommend him, I'm surprised it just occurred to me, but um, they're documenting a lot of what's happened. He's got some amazing, findings around how trade from you know, the acorn economy and when we started seeing obsidian coming from the Sierras. So I think the best thing we can do to preserve it is to kind of understand and really you know, study that while it's still here. Um, there's not much I think that we can do in that setting to really preserve them, um, but we can um, preserve the knowledge. Mm. Um. As someone else was, uh, Howard was asking that, he said earlier slides in uh, on historic climate cycles are very useful, but do you know uh, um, of any published graphs that superimpose say last three natural glaciation cycles and predicted next glaciation cycle timeline with modeled climate change data from the industrial era and projected forward maybe two to 3000 years if no change is made in the current CO2 production? Um, that's a great question, and I would uh, refer you to the latest IPCC report. Um, there's all kinds of stuff like that in that report. And we'll call it, we'll, um, we'll do a link of that on our follow-up email, too. Yeah, you know. and, and I have that in the presentation as well. I just didn't bring it back to this the end, so... Okay. Um, let's see. And, and the next question, uh, California just allotted about $18 million to refurbish the Pigeon Point Lighthouse. We were talking about this before. Now I see that the, that area is a danger from sea level rise. What should they do about the lighthouse? That's a great question. Um, and, you know, this is, 
it, it's a challenge and it's it's kind of a microcosm for the kinds of decisions we're going to have to make going forward um, you know we have a lot of history and a lot of cultural um, and aesthetics associated with the lighthouse um, you know for 18 million we're going to try and restore it in place um, but there's you know there's a trade-off like we could move it and rebuild a new one for probably less than 18 million somewhere else. Um, but those are the kinds of choices that we're going to have to make going forward. Um, I think that decision is, um, is it, it, we'll see how long the, you know, erosion takes there. It is a pretty hard uh, geologic um, bedrock formation there. And so, it, you know, we might get 50 years out of it still. So, um, you know, I think it's, that's sort of the choice that people, that the state and the uh, Historic Preservation Office have made. Steve asked, this is interesting, this may be a stretch, he says, but are there linkages between specific adaptation measures and water quality? And I know this isn't necessarily your area, but the lousy water quality, he says, the lousy water quality around Half Moon Bay beaches is a concern to me and an embarrassment to the community and the county. Is it is a twofer possible? <laughs> That's all gets into my whole sand shed <laughs> piece um, in that, you know, what, it, there's a lot of reasons that we have deteriorated water quality. Um, you know, most of South San Mateo County is on septic. Um, and a, a lot of that septic was built years and years and years ago and you know, redwood and, you know, have deteriorated. So as we upgrade, and I see this on the San Lorenzo River in Santa Cruz, the upland watershed as those septics are being replaced, we're seeing improvements in the water quality in the watershed. Um, places right around, say, Half Moon Bay and Surfers Beach, um, or Surfers Rocks as it is right now, um, you know, a lot of that has to do with ocean circulation. Um, when you get around the headlands, you tend to get a, a sort of a circulation pattern that brings sort of the red tides and kind of traps things up there. Um, in terms of the effect of water quality on of, of adaptation on water quality, it really, part of it depends on what the contaminant is. If it's sediment, there's certainly things we can do in our watersheds to reduce sediment. But I also, and I pose this to the head of EPA, a lot of our efforts at reducing sediment loads to our system are the same things that are preventing those big flows from moving sand and cobbles down the watersheds to our beaches. So I think thinking about how the plumbing of our watersheds um, are affected by adaptation strategies, I think is an important one to consider. I'm not sure if I answered that entirely, but that's a, a good question. I, I can give that a little bit faster, a little bit deeper thought. Um, Robert is asking, are you concerned that scientists feel a responsibility to not upset the status quo for fear of losing funding and or support? And they're making projections and talking to the public and all of that. It's, it's interesting. That's a, a great question. Um, I think there are a lot of scientists um, who are really worried about their scientific credibility. Um, I faced something in my career where I was kind of going down, I was going to do the professor route. And then I sort of looked around and said, but they don't really solve any problems. They just think about them. And so we need basic research. We need to understand how things work, but we also have to kind of turn this ship in a different direction and start solving problems using the best science that we have today. Mm -hmm. And I think there are some academics who are very much at the forefront of trying to learn and project and inform adaptation and decision-making. And then there's a lot that are scared to sort of say what they've learned um, for fear of losing funding or losing their scientific 
um, sort of neutrality and credibility. So I do see there's kind of several camps out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you mentioned uh, uh, Abby and and Sean asked what what reactive measures do we need to take to protect the coastside residents, and you sort of outlined those sort of the options are those those channels. So it'd be be wonderful to hear from people if you had questions about um, or or had thoughts specifically as community. Um, J Judy asked, and you and I know you spoke to this a bit, but any good resources for her? She's she was asking about how you know ocean ocean warms as we are as the ocean warms are we likely to see more severe storms and hurricanes on our coast at some point? Um, any thoughts you want to share with her? On yeah, the, again the the there's a couple of great resources. There's the report on um, the new IPCC report, um, and then there is uh, California in 2018 released a sort of summary of the science of sea level rise and climate change in California. Um, there's, uh, and every, every two years or three years, I forget offhand, but um, the state invests in sort of a state climate change assessment. And there's a great website called CalAdapt where you can go in and I can make sure that that you know, gets into the follow-ups here. But CalAdapt will let you kind of go in and look at what's the projected for heat, for precipitation, for droughts, for snowpack, for a lot of different climate variables than what we're talking about here. Um, specifically to the question about increasing storm intensities, um, that is something that came out pretty strongly in the AR6, the latest IPCC report that we are anticipating more extreme uh, storm events. Um, what we're seeing in, say, the hurricanes, for example, is um, they're not necessarily faster wind speeds or more storms, but what we're doing is we're slowing them. And so as all of that temperature and stuff come, you know, it is uh, the heat in the ocean as it warms allows more evaporation, so there's more moisture in the atmosphere to cause rain. And as that goes, what's happening now is the hurricanes are slowing down. So that precipitation, instead of you know, moving through at say 50 miles an hour, is now moving at five miles an hour, allowing the precipitation to saturate and fall in one place. Um, that's an example of kind of some of the changes in the storm dynamics that we're seeing. Um, the question has been researched, are we seeing more significant wave heights? Or, and um, USGS has done some really cool work, I'd say state of the science, uh, looking at the effects of that climate change on wave conditions. And what we've seen is not necessarily an increase in wave heights, um, but a shift um, to more northerly wave directions. So the storms are more in the Gulf of Alaska and an increase in the Southern Hemisphere, Southern Ocean wave events. So as the ice uh, in the Antarctic area is narrowing, we're allowing more wind and larger waves from the Southern Hemisphere. So we're getting more south swells, um, which is a shift in sort of the wave directionality. Um, and that could have a significant change. But the other thing to consider is also the direction of winds. Um, a lot of that is still kind of on the cutting edge of science right now. Um, and there's active research on all of that. Thank you very much, David Rebel. We're, we're really grateful for this presentation. Thank you all so much for being here and, and joining us for this free community webinar. A lot of, a lot of things to be thinking about. And I know that, um, I, he, uh, our presenter just shared with us a number of resources that we will attach to our follow-up email afterwards. So um, especially the, you know, the CalADAPT and IPCC report and, um, and we have the name of the archeologist. So we'll add that on there as well. Um, yeah. and, and please, um, please sign up at the, go to the Sea Change website and you know, get plugged in. We'll be having another round of public meetings on the economics and some of the other detailed adaptation findings in the next few months, so. Great. This is a uh, conversation will continue. 
and people that and you couldn't be speaking to a better crowd because these are people who are showing up to be learning about this and to be having these critical conversations so yeah exactly please be a part of that um, moving forward and yeah thank you for your continued support through donation this continues to be the critical funding that's running these programs like these free community webinars aim to connect you to the environment and and to learn more about um, where you are and and the animal species and plant species and also learning about what's happening to the land around us. Um, funding also supports the protection and stewardship of our essential open spaces and that includes our junior land stewards program which help, is helping students of Cabrillo Unified to develop the skills and desires to become lifelong stewards of the land. So all this really critical and we thank you for your continued support your donations. Um, we have an upcoming webinar in October, in just about a month, um, on bats by Nat Goodby, the ecology of bats and um, their, their niche in our area. So it'll be really, really interesting as well. So please um, keep your eye out for upcoming, uh, we'll have an email coming out soon about that, or you can hop on our website um, and, and learn a little bit about that and sign up for that. Um, there will also be a link to the recording of this uh, this presentation. So share it, get people connected, um, have conversations in the community and get people to connect to that. Um, the resource where you can come together and, and have these conversations, these critical conversations. Um, yeah, so thank you again for being here. And thank you, thank you, David Revel. And we will see you all, or many of you, again in a month. Thank right. you, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye.